Get out the insurance cards, get out the co-pays. The office is open, my friends. Brought to you by DrRoto.com. What is up, Ben? Welcome in. We are the one and done show. We are your fast break of college basketball information. I am your host, Eric Romoff. You can catch me on those Twitter streets at Fantasy Nav. And he is the captain of our ship here at Greens Greens Media. He is the OG Money Mike. He is MC Holland34 on Twitter. He is Mr. Mike Holland. Mike, we are finally here. <laughs> we are down to the last game of the season, which means we're down to the last slate of the season. How are you feeling? on this Sunday night. I'm feeling good, man. I cannot believe we are closing up college basketball season for the year because me and your boy Nate C. Hustle have been grinding away at this transfer portal board. Uh, plan is to release it Tuesday. Uh, so obviously we have the national championship tomorrow. I'm not going to release that while people are looking for info on that. So we're going to release it on Tuesday. It will be filled with 300 names. We've already got commitments. We've already done a show about the offseason already, and that's kind of a weird thing to say when uh, you know, you're still in the middle of a, <laughs> of a tournament to determine the, the champion for this year. So that is college basketball. I am excited, man. Uh, what, what say you about this matchup that we got going on tomorrow? It feels like uh, Chalk ends up ruling the day here. Yeah, Chalk ends up ruling. I think this been the last time we were out here. It is increasingly rare. In the uh, in the age of the transfer portal and of NIL, to find uh, the uh, by and large assumed two best teams in all of college basketball facing off for the national title, so it is going to be an absolute treat to watch that game tomorrow night. And here we are with uh, with DraftKings randomly giving us a 50k to first top prize on the showdown slate. So for tonight's show. Uh, we're going to kick off talking off talking a little bit about the showdown format and some of the strategies that go into it there. Then we'll dive into the game itself going all the way down the depth chart because we're going to have to dive into some interesting options at the very low end. And then like Mike alluded to, uh, we're going to we're going to jump into some of this offseason news, right? The uh, the portal has been popping all the way through the uh, the March Madness tournament. So we have players that have just jumped in. We've got players that have new homes already. So we're going to make sure that you have everything that you need before we set off for the night. And one of the things that I need are people jumping into this comment section like Forklift Jeremy hitting us with the good evening and the salute. Good evening to yourself, Jeremy. Appreciate you swinging through. Hope you're ready to see that 50k top prize. I heard you got a couple of a couple of tickets punched for uh, for some of those big tournaments tomorrow. So Looking forward to, to going through the slate. Appreciate you swinging through. If you are like Jeremy and you're chilling with us on YouTube, jump up in the comment section. Let us know how you're feeling. Let us know if you have game predictions. Let us know if you have any questions about the slate. If you're already looking to next year and you want to talk about maybe some uh, some portal prospects for your team, whatever it may be, jump up in that comment section. Let us know that you're here and how you're feeling. And while you hit the like and subscribe button. So, that is the uh, the setup for tonight's show. Mike, you want to jump right into the overview for the slate? Yeah, man. Uh, boy, like this is showdown. So this is we've done 54, 54 shows involving DFS and more shows, you know, with other shows, some of the recaps we've given core fours for like Monday slates too. So uh, we have not done a showdown slate. Um, we we only did one last year, and that was the national championship game. So uh, different process than what we're used to. Um, you know, like you've got the, the salary is the same, but you only pick six players. You have the captain uh, that gets one and a half the scoring, but costs one and a half <laughs> times their normal price. And then you have five utility players. You got to play uh, one person from each side. So uh, different format. Obviously, there are a ton, a ton of entrants in this thing to win 50,000. Uh, I don't know that it's even remotely possible to have a solo winner with this many entrants. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, man? Is that, uh, I mean, I wouldn't mind chopping 50K with like, you know, you know, 15 people plus whatever, second, third, fourth, fifth, <laughs> all combined together. But what are your thoughts? Is there a way to get a solo winner, man? Man, uh, with the way that DraftKings structures uh, these slates, 
a 15 way 15 way chop of 50k might be one of the largest paydays of the entire cbv season so wouldn't be mad at that at all uh in in terms of getting unique right like the the easiest way and it's something that we talk about all season long is leaving salary um even more so in the in the context of a showdown slate the the more you leave the you know the the far and away more likely it is that you have just a little bit of a wrinkle in your build to where if you do at have that ceiling outcome you're not chopping with 15 or 50 or 500 people right you might be chopping yeah. with one or two. Yeah, um, I said 15 but there's a real possibility you're chopping with 300 people <laughs> with the a, same a very strong possibility especially if the chalk hits right like if all the big name players are the ones that are getting there you're going to be looking at several hundred people <laughs> that you're that you're chopping with right so leaving some salary is a great way to do it uh, five one overloads is another way to do it, right? Most people tend to go towards a little bit more of a balanced build. I always um, do that, man. I always want to be like, I got to get like two from one side or three from one side, uh, yeah. get two or three from the other. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, stacking stacking those up are are a couple of different ways to to try to differentiate your build overall. But we also we need to spend a little time talking about the the strategies itself, right? Like. For for me within within the showdown game specifically at that captain spot right you're paying 1.5x their price tag you're getting 1.5x their productivity I mean I I always try to have a pretty narrow pool of captain options and I'm really looking for the guys that have the highest likelihood of scoring the most points so putting that differently I'm generally paying up for captain right those are the guys <laughs> that have 40 to 50 well represented. <laughs> on their on their range right so you know guys like Edie, like caravan like newton you know these are guys that i'm probably going to have a ton of exposure to but um you know with with Edie's case 20k to roster him in the in the captain spot with Klingon's case 16k uh 15k for for newton right so you're really going to have to get comfortable and familiar with the far reaches of the benches for both of these squads if you're if you're going to be paying 20 16 15k for your captain spot so like uh like really like paying up at that at that top spot trying to get those ceiling outcomes and then after that like i mean it's it's really it's a numbers game in terms of um in in terms of roster construction right like you you have to try to cover a lot of different bases so build out a core of you know two three guys that you know you want to rotate around rotate around them in that captain spot and in the flex spot and then you know try to try to cover all the different outcomes for you know these these sort of fringy guys that may may have their ceiling game is is really kind of the direction that I take on on most showdown slates uh, but that's only that's only part of the story right mike we also have to talk about the game theory overall you're not just playing this and building these rosters in a vacuum you're playing against several thousand of your closest friends and you have to try <laughs> to create leverage off of them right friends and enemies now um yeah, it's it's game theory, right? We talk about game theory in the context of you know twelve game slates, and it's there's just so many players, right? That even if your game theory works, there might be another game theory that works even better in a different game. Um, mm-hmm. So that back may just go off, or you get an overtime. Well, it's just one single game here, so you got to think about like what happens if he's in foul trouble. What happens if any of the guards like if what happens if anybody that starts gets into foul trouble, especially the high usage players, so guys like Zach Eady. Guys like Braden Smith, you know, on the UConn side, it's more spread out, right? Um, Klingon, I don't think, is going to garner a lot of ownership as well as E because of the price tag when you put him in your uh, your captain spot, more flex plays uh, that you'll see them in. So can you create a lineup with Klingon? A little bit easier than it is with, with E.D. We are messing around with it, and it's just really tough to do that. So, uh, you know, the foul game narrative is, is one way to do it. Uh, you know, some of these mid-tier guys, you mentioned Caravan. Um you're sitting there at 8,200, Stefan Castle, 7,600. These are guys that can get 30, you know, plus fantasy points. When you multiply that by one and a half, right, and then you're able to see the salary difference that you say between paying someone for a captain like that and a Tristan Newton, that is the difference between getting someone at, you put, sticking someone in there at 3,200 and or 5,600. You know what I mean? That's like, it's, a, it's such a huge difference. I mean, that could mean, you know, 28 minutes versus, you know, somebody that plays maybe nine minutes, uh, like a Camden Heidi or somebody like that. So uh, game theory, always going to be very important for showdown. 
but I mean, it just comes down to pricing, man. Like there's going to be so many builds where you start off trying to figure out like, how do I, how do I do this with Edie? How do I do this with Tristan Newton? I'm like, okay, well, what does it look like when it's Braden Smith and, and, you know, and, and Cam Spencer? Um, so that's going to be your, your narrative that you're, you know, obviously going to go through. I don't know that there's a super punt. Um, like yeah. they, because <laughs> we talk about Purdue all the time. Like the, the two guys at the top, Edie's usage rates too crazy. Um, and then UConn's the opposite. Their usage is all spread out. And they mm-hmm. play a very short rotation when a couple of guys come off the bench. So, like, how how can you pay down at captain? That is a – I mean, if you get someone down here in the dirt that can get you, like, a Hassan DR that can get you 15 fantasy points, maybe you have a chance of stacking ED and all that. But if you find someone that has an ED who goes bonkers at the captain and they have, you know, DR with – you know, one of the, you know, maybe a Camden Heidi that maybe scores eight fantasy points, that's going to beat you. So, yeah, we're just going to have to, we're going to have to work through it. We'll talk about it. We'll go down the rosters from each team, see who we got, you know, who we want to pluck, how this is going to work, and what we think about their price tags, man. So, uh, any final thoughts on the overview? Are we trying to jump into the players here? No, I think, I think we're ready to jump in. Like, like you said, Mike, we're going to, we're going to go top to bottom on these rosters and, and really try to find a couple of those diamonds in the rough to go with some of the more, brand name players that we've been talking about all season uh if you haven't already do your part hit those like and subscribe buttons also i need to do my part which is updating our one and done bracket challenge i gave this update uh, i guess about a week or so ago no change as the chalk has advanced through to the national title game so it's basically going to come down to this game itself if uconn wins then jeff gagner is taking home this signed caleb love jersey if Purdue pulls the upset or the slight upset, um, then our friend Eric Myers will be the lucky winner of that new autograph. So definitely appreciate everyone that participated in it. Love to see all of those breadheads jumping in. And it's it's awesome that it comes down to the final game. So definitely uh, excited to see how this one shakes out, not only between those two, but also on these DFS greets, which is where we're heading in. I mentioned it earlier Purdue is a slight underdog. UConn is actually a three-point favorite. This is one that is carrying a 147-point total, according to Ken Palm. Also, according to Ken Palm, and according to the eye test, and basically anyone who's paid attention to college basketball, both these teams are really good. Uh, Purdue is third in offensive efficiency, (laughs) 12th in defensive efficiency. They play a little bit slow, 211 in uh, in the tempo department. UConn, Tops them pretty much in every category. First on the offensive side, fourth on the defensive side, and painfully slow, 328th in tempo. So uh, definitely a uh, you know a heavyweight bout here for uh, the Purdue side is where we will start. You know, I I, I think um, you know we're 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 really. We're really looking at a, a a pretty interesting breakdown here, right? Like you know, Ed is obviously going to be their their highest projected player, uh, but there are there are a few different ways that you can think about this Purdue side. So, Mike, taking a look at the the Boilermakers, right? Like maybe we start with some of their top options, uh, kind of talk through the the guys that are maybe catching your eyes as potential captain options, and then after we we kind of create that pool, we'll uh, we'll drill in and talk through some of the flex options that we want to rotate around. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it starts with Edie, right? I, I think he's going to be. I think he's going to be super popular in a sense of flex, um, because every mm-hmm. no one's going to want to go. You're not. You don't want to go into this just saying, <laughs> "I don't want to play Zach Edie." I mean, 44, 66, 46, 56, 66. He's going to give you 40 fantasy points, even if he's in foul trouble. The question is, is there any way to play him at twenty thousand? $400 in the captain spot. I, I don't know how you do that. It, that is, it, it seems almost impossible. Uh, he needs to, if, if you have him in the captain spot, obviously he can go for, you know, 60. He needs to get <laughs> 55 plus uh, in the captain spot. And uh, you're going to need, you're still going to need some help because a lot of people in the flex, you're not going to be that far ahead. You're going to be, you know, melted on salary. Mm-hmm. You'll be uh, you'll be feeling good, but you won't be feeling good when you see what the rest of your roster looks like. So, when I look at it from a Purdue side, as far as like captains that I'm interested in, yes, I have to have interest in Zach Eady, right? But when you do it and you start plugging in, it's like, oh god, 
So it's like, who's the next guy on Purdue that I would want to captain? I feel like they're more contrarian than what you'll find on the UConn side because Purdue, right, their usage and, and fantasy points are really tied. For ceilings are tied to Zach Eady. On the UConn side, you kind of have to spin the wheel to figure out what two guys are going to go for 30 plus uh, that or 35 plus that night. And sometimes a third one will get there. But most of the time, it's at least two getting to 35. On um, Purdue, it's like, okay, Zach, he's going for, is he going for 50, 60, or 65? And then the rest of the guys on the Purdue side, it's like, all right, like Braden Smith has 40 fantasy point upside, so he's kind of intriguing, right, at 13,800. I mean, it's a massive savings from Edie in the captain spot. I think he's um, probably going to be very contrarian. Um, I mean, he hasn't done much lately. I know he has the 50 spot in there, so people will probably look at that and say, could I get Braden Smith as a captain? and play Edie in the flex, I mean, that's certainly possible, but you're still eating up a ton, I mean, over $27,000 in salary uh, if you do that, but it feels a lot better than eating 20000 on Edie. So if you get a Braden <laughs> Smith ceiling game, which is, you know, upwards of 40 fantasy points, right, that 50 really sticks out, that's more of a 40 to, you know, especially in this in this matchup, if you get a 40 from Braden Smith, you have Edie 60, uh, you know, plus the 60 that Smith would have if he gets to a 40. Like you have to, you have to feel decent that you only maybe need to find like a punt and a half. <laughs> um, you know, because the salary, right? You don't, you're using up more than half of your salary to to get there. So, um, while I feel like I want to try to find a way to find Edie, I feel like finding ways to game theory like Braden Smith feels a lot better. Um, doing that, it's like well, you kind of have to talk yourself into playing one of the. Uh, the other two bigs for Purdue that we always do, and it's TKR and Mason Gillis. Mason Gillis in here at 5,800 in the flex. Trey Kaufman Wren, uh, you know, 5,000 in the flex. One of these guys is going to go for 14, 15, 16 fantasy points. Now, they both went for 13 last game, uh, but very rarely are they each kind of doing that. It's usually one guy or the other. I think in this matchup, I like Mason Gillis because of who's on the other side, because of Alex Caravan. You know, TKR is more of a post present on offense. He's not really like a perimeter defender. Now, Mason Gillis, Gillis lives on the perimeter on offensive side, you know, a little more mobile. Plus, I feel like Painter trusts him more. So I'm more inclined, even though it's $800 more, to play Mason Gillis. Um, now, TKR obviously going to have uh, probably higher ownership, right, because he's $800 cheaper in every single – uh, dollars going to matter in this thing, which makes me like Gillis even more. But also if you're playing like a game theory where maybe UConn gets out early, uh, you know, you could find yourself with uh, with Gillis getting a ton of run because he is a great three-point shooter, 47% from three. And that three ball in these showdowns, oh, it's like butter. When they hit when, when you hit the three in the showdown, you're like, oh, you're, you're loving that. Three and, a half, I mean, three and a half fantasy points. I mean, that's the absolute – biggest score on one possession that you can get, you know, barring the, the old steel layup, um, you know, that obviously can go for four points, but uh, you know, you love to see that. So Mason Gillis at the 5,800. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say TKI is not a bad play because we've seen him go for like random, just random type games where he goes for 20 plus. Uh, 38 like against those, Utah state. <laughs> yeah. Thir- yeah. That was a ridiculous game. So, I mean, typically when he's hitting the ceilings, it's in the twenties low twenties, typically same thing with Mason Gillis kind of low twenties um, or where these guys are getting. So if I'm building, you know, a, a lineup with Braden Smith and the captain EDM flex, I, I'm probably looking at Gillis or TKR in that spot. Um, you're still going to find yourself real strapped for cash. If you're trying to get UConn runbacks. So that's why it takes us down to Camden Heidi, who he hasn't done much recently, but if ED has a ceiling game, you don't – I mean, six six to eight fantasy points would be pretty pretty choice from, from Camden Heidi here. Um, the minutes have been obviously trending down. Uh, you know, first round, Grambling gets 22, obviously. Utah State in the blowout gets 15, plays really well, 14 fantasy points. Only sees 11 minutes against Gonzaga and two shots. 12 minutes against Tennessee, no shots. Seven minutes against NC State, one shot. Like – to say that he needs to make the most of his <laughs> his limited field goal opportunities uh, is, is really saying something. But if he hits A3 and is able to collect a couple of rebounds and maybe fall over another stat, I mean, he could definitely be an optimal uh, kind of like solo winner. Uh, so Cannon Heidi, 
somewhat interesting. I, I don't know, Eric. Like, I feel like the maybe fouls because of how physical both of these teams are inside. I could see Edie or Klingon or Caravan or TKR or Mason Gillis. Like, these guys, like Camden and Heidi, they, they become slightly interesting. So, uh, you know, any, any thoughts on, on you know, the, the Edie captain spot and – I didn't even talk about Lawyer and, and Jones because it feels like, you know, at their price tags, if you want to play Edie, it's, like, really hard to get to those guys as well. Um, they're always great stacking partners with Edie because they're way cheaper than Braden Smith. So uh, any thoughts on, on on this Purdue side that you got? Yeah, this side's real tricky. Um, you know, peeling off 20K for Edie at the captain spot, it, it just – it kind of it kind of handcuffs you, right? Like, you're going to have to get real comfortable with guys like Camden Heidi and uh, uh, Samson Johnson and uh, Diara on the other side, just to even have like any kind of optionality within the rest <laughs> of your build. So, you know, part of me from like a practical standpoint, I'd much rather have some flexibility, but also part of me looks at the very strong likelihood that Zach Eady is probably going to be under owned as a captain and that sort of screams opportunity for me, especially <laughs> like there, there are things kind of baked into this, right? Like the assumption is that you're going to fire a pile of bullets at this, which is, you know, part of the overarching right. strategy yeah. for showdown in general. And so if, if you're going to do that and you end up with 10, 12, 15% more ED at captain in the fields, you have a huge advantage, right? Yeah. Cause there, I mean, there is, nobody else that can really go north of 60 um <laughs> certainly nobody that can push you know 65 70 so if if this is that game and you're even slightly overweight to the field with ed i mean you you talked about heidi getting you six points right like <laughs> yeah. he's he's shooting 45 percent from from three on a on a pretty pretty limited sampling of shot attempts because he's never on the court like if this <laughs> is that game where he hits it you're doing plenty fine pairing him up with ed in the event that ED also hits his ceiling game. I also think there's something that you brought up that, you know, really, really underscores an, an interesting point, right? Like with, with, with lawyer, with Lance Jones, like I, I don't know if they're going to be all that popular. Cause they just kind of sit in a weird spot from a pricing standpoint, right? Like people are going up to ED, right? I mean, he's going to be near 100% owned when he looks at his, at his flex ownership. Braden Smith is going to be a very popular pivot off that. And then after that point, like I think most people are looking to 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 pay down, right? People are going to be looking at Gillis and TKR and to a lesser extent Camden Heidi and Lawyer and Lance Jones are just going to be kind of sitting there. So, you know, in, in the case of both these guys, kind of like it's been for the last handful of slates, they're basically the same price. Fletcher Lawyer is two hundred dollars more expensive than Lance Jones, six point six K. I mean, lawyer is that classic shot dependent type of guy, right? 19% shot rate, shooting 45% on his 143 point attempts. You know, the the minutes are up in the tourney. We we see those rotations getting more and more tight as teams get deeper into the tournament. So you you like the fact that he's getting a little bit more run out there. You know, it it feels it feels better to play these guys with um, you know, with like a like a Smith or a, you know, a Gillis TKR type of combination, but that, that comfort that, you know, that the fact that that feels good, you know, is, is an <laughs> indicator that more no people team. are probably going to do it. Right. So like going, going up to him with Edie, you know, lawyers got a, got a 12% assist rate. That's, you know, that'll, that'll work just fine. If we see the classic Purdue playbook of <laughs> all the usage and basically the entire offense rolling through Zach Edie, you can, you can definitely make things work with lawyer, and same can be said with Lance Jones, right? Two hundred dollars cheaper, twelve percent assist rate. So he's, you know, he's a good stacking option, sort of regardless of how you want to attack the Purdue side. Like how he stacks up with with Ed, right? He was he was my my X factor when we broke down the, the the game heading into the Final Four. You know, stepped up in a pretty big way as Ed had kind of like an average or okay ish game um, in that last game against NC State. I mean, look, he's he's the three and D guy, right? Like he's the one that, you know, I, I think can still be a key to this game now that we talk about the national championship. So if you know, if if he's getting a little bit more usage in this context, sitting at six point four K, handing out, you know, en enough dimes, like you can you can feel 
okay about stacking him up with Edie, at least from a from a game theory standpoint. So here, here's my question though: like, if you put Edie in the captain spot, I, mean, I know what you're saying because of the leverage piece, right? You can get more guys, um, or you can have a higher ceiling, right? If you're able to hit a Heidi six, but, but doesn't every lineup kind of look the same with? ed at captain like i don't how do you how do you i guess how do you differentiate an ed lineup so like if we can stick him in the captain spot we'll see that you have uh it's like 5.9 5.9 k in the uh in the captain's uh spot for ed so like you talk like there are i mean there okay so gillis tk okay gillis 5800 tkr 5000 camden heidi 3600 miles colvin is 16 i don't think you i mean Zero one. So there's one. there's the first question, right? Like as as we talk about putting together a showdown lineup, running down this roster top to bottom. Obviously, Smith, Lawyer, Jones, all fine options. You feel comfortable with them? We need we need to find that cutoff point. Gillis is in the pool. TKR is in the pool. Heidi's in the pool. Is that where is that where the line stops? <laughs> yeah, I or, think that's or can, where you, that... can you maybe sniff down in some of these super savers? No, there's no way. There's no way. Like and, and so the ED the ED captains what I'm saying is the ED captains are automatically going to have one of TKR or Gillis, they're going to have a Sandiara. So those lineups, uh, you know, most people are going to want to play TKR at 5K, and then they're going to want to play uh, DR on the other side for 5400. That's going to give you a little over six grand. But you can't you can't pay for anybody at six grand like. Nope. Unless you want to go heavy on the Purdue side, because you can't get to one of the five guys on the UConn side. You can't get to Klingon, Newton, who are over 10K flex. Can Spencer, damn near 10K flex. I mean, Stefan Castle is, is the, and Caravan is basically the fifth wheel every now, you know, <laughs> every other game. 8,200 and 7,600. You already played Diara. Oh, There's literally Stephon. no one to play. Like, there is no one to play. So that. It's scary. Like, yeah, okay. Take your Heidi six, take yep. your TKR twelve. Yep. Take your DR fourteen. I guess it could be enough. It, but if a lot of people play that, then you're playing. I feel like the same lineups against other people. So I don't. To me, that it renders Zach Eady as a flex option. I don't want to say. I, just, I, I can't even finish the sentence. As a flex option. Only, <laughs> I'm not gonna say. I know when it comes down to it, I'm gonna have one or two ED captain lineups. But I know that my one or two ED captain lineups, Eric, are gonna be the same as everyone else's one or two ED lineups. It might not. So I I don't know if that's necessarily the case, right? Um, and the the thing is, like going this route, it's hard to build an optimal lineup. Um, but an optimal lineup is almost certainly not chipping a, a solo first or even like a double digit split to first. Right. So like you're kind of, you're kind of banking on some, some atypical outcomes coming right. to pass. I, I guess but so, with, yeah. with, with this, with this four pack, right? Like you have to get down to Heidi. You have to go between TKR or Gillis will go TKR, which will probably be the more popular of those two choices to your point earlier. Now you've got Diara in there. You've got almost eight K per player left rotating around through basically every combination of the players available to you in these two remaining utility spots is how you get different, right? Because there are going to be people like me who are looking at Stefan Castle, who <laughs> like shout out to the kid just completely cemented his case uh, as a high NBA draft pick in that last game. Sure. Um, you know, Alabama came in and their game plan was clear. Like this kid's <laughs> got to beat us. And he was yeah. like, great. <laughs> This is exactly what I wanted. <laughs> um, so he went out and cooked. And in turn, he went up 2K in price tag, right? Like, <laughs> if that happened before, if that happened in any other round where he wasn't yeah. heading into a showdown, he would yeah, go up be, 700, he'd be, he'd be 7K, maybe 1,000. Like right? <laughs> um, so point being, like, I would love to play him. I would, I would not ever want to play him at 7.6K. But in this context... I'm absolutely going to be rotating but, him through here, right? You can pair him the up. The point with, being, see that is that, but if Edie, you're going to have heavy, and Scott's jumping in here. Appreciate you, Scott. Like, what kind of builds you like three, three, four, two, five, one? Um, we're going to have to kind of talk about that as a summary here. But if you're playing Edie at captain, you're going to have a heavier Purdue lineup. 
100%, because you can yeah. play a castle. You're gonna have to go back to the. You can't get. You got the sixth man, and they only really play seven or eight guys for UConn. You have to. You basically almost have to go four two. Like you have to go four two on Purdue to play eighty. Eighty is going Pretty to be to it, yeah. not uh, like very very low. I. I guess I don't even I you can't say that because it's college basketball and people just want to play E because of the ceiling. So I just I I feel like by saying this I'm getting myself into trouble. But it but if you just look at it from a mathematical standpoint, you're going to be heavy Purdue. Purdue is the underdog. Like you're gonna have lineups that feel the same, especially if you want a run back and people are gonna want a run back. They're gonna want a Newton run back or the castle run back or caravan run back or Whoever the hell you want us to run back, and that's going to dive you right into those guards in the middle. It's going to dive you right back to Mason Gillis or TKR, which one of you didn't pick. So, yeah, I mean, it's going to be uh, – it's just going to be tough. And so I would be absolutely shocked. I, if I had to put a number on it, I would say he's 20% just because I know showdowns, right, or at least from the NFL. Mm-hmm. and <laughs> Like, but I don't know that I want to be 20%. I, I almost want to be – 10%. And if he goes bonkers and you split 50K 700 ways, then I, you know, I'm, what is, I mean, what's the math on, <laughs> what's the math on, on, because I might change my mind. I might want to be one of those, uh, one of those 700, uh, <laughs> one of those 700, yeah, right. uh, you know, entrants that are in there. So let's see, 50K divided by 700. I have 71 bucks. 71 bucks. 71 bucks. Or as as we like to call it, a sixth place finish on any other <laughs> slate this year. <laughs> essentially. Essentially. So you'll find yeah. that by putting Smith into that captain spot, playing, uh, you know, or really anybody else in the captain spot, your roster construction, when you when you get to ED, the, fo- the fourth man, the fifth man becomes hard to play. When you don't play ED, it's the last spot that becomes the hardest to play. So, yeah, man, I think that pretty much covers the Purdue side. You know, we touched on Castle, man. You want to flip it over here to the UConn side and and uh, and see what's cooking? Or you want to take a look at maybe a yeah. Smith build? What do you want to do on this Purdue side? Yeah, we can uh, we can jump over to the to the UConn side and then to to wrap it up, we'll we'll play with some some builds, some more captains. I mean, look, like granted, having three value options on any (laughs) build is not the the happiest place to be but like sitting here with these three with almost 8k per player like i i've been in i've been in dicier spots (laughs) um largely by by my own doing right so we'll 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 talk through the yukon side and then we'll we'll kind of uh, put our heads together on a few different build textures before we do though got our we've got our man on the street cam c thuggin checking in from phoenix with the salute Cam, how's it going out in Phoenix? We need we need a we need a live report from the from the from the Final Four facility heading into the <laughs> national title game. Need to know what the vibes are like. Need to know how the the betting public's feeling. Need to know if if you're watching any practices and you gotta you gotta read on any on any one K guys. Maybe maybe Culver Colvin's getting some extra run in in warmups. Right. We need to know what it's looking like there in Phoenix. So appreciate you checking in. Also appreciate the, traffic. the <laughs> insight. Terrible. Yeah. The intel as because yeah it's it's Scottsdale right I, I heard about this when the Super Bowl was out there a few years ago it's just like yeah they say it's Phoenix but you still got like an hour drive to get up to the game <laughs> especially in traffic so like Goodman and let us know tweeting, what the, like, uh, you gotta you gotta like get, you gotta leave now you have to leave now it's like two hours before the game <laughs> yeah exactly we've also got Jeff Gagner checking in with the what's up fellas um, um, hope all is good hope all is good for. For you, he's been out in uh, in in Keeneland, um, and I don't I don't know if, if you've been checking in on the show or not, Jeff. You're the uh, you're the leader in the clubhouse for this signed Caleb Love jersey. You're you're rooting for uh, for UConn here. The uh, the Huskies take it home. You're taking home that that uh, that piece of memorabilia. So appreciate you swinging through. Hope all is good with you. Getting a little bit of that live reporting. The uh, the live the live bets get in before they update. After the uh, the made basket, so <laughs> sounds like those uh, those in game bets are flying in Phoenix, which is always a fun scene. So, Mike, like you mentioned, we'll uh, we'll jump over to the UConn side here, kind of like I laid up laid out off the top, kind of a short list of caption captain options in my mind, right? Really looking at um, you know some of the the most expensive 
players in Klingon and Spencer and Newton as as where my eye immediately goes to as potential captains. But kind okay. of working up and down the roster here, like you think there's a you think there's a decent case for you know any of these you know kind of secondary pieces on the on the Husky side to slot all the way into the captain. I'm gonna disagree a little bit with you on the UConn side. I think all six. Um, we're talking the starting five and Hassan DR. I think all six are at least like in consideration for the captain spot. We're on Purdue. <laughs> I think it's Edie Smith, and that's probably it for for captain spots. It, how does how does Zach Edie not have like a fifty percent usage rate? <laughs> it just all goes through him. And to your point, it's the it's the exact opposite with UConn, right? Like they yeah, spread it out know. pretty like, evenly across everyone. Right, exactly. And my thing is, is I don't like the front court against Edie because he draws a ton of fouls. And Klingon's wanted to get into foul trouble. <laughs> like it's not like he's like he you know this. Yeah, he, he goes for shot. You know, he goes for block shots. Um, God, that captain tag for him is. It's terrifying. Sixteen point <laughs> um, two is a lot. I mean, that's and somehow just... a huge savings from the twenty k that Edie's got still. <laughs> yeah, seriously, like it's it's pretty ridiculous. Um, Files called per forty. He is uh the guys that play of the starters. He is right behind Castle. Three point five fouls called per forty minutes, which isn't terrible. But also, you have to remember he doesn't play as many minutes as he's going to play a pile of minutes in this one. If he, well, if he's in foul trouble, he's not. But Bama played twenty nine, like you know, Northwestern, the, the you know, kind of the more the closest game he dominated. And that game was over at <laughs> at halftime. Yeah. Um, Northwestern, he played twenty seven. He's going to play high twenties, possibly thirty minutes in this one if he's not in foul trouble. So the fouls per forty a little dis, you know distorted based on how many minutes he actually plays because he's not able to rack up that many fouls because he's most of the time like he'll play eighteen minutes like early in the season right like you mix this data in with early in the season um, you know he's playing eighteen and, you know just going forty fantasy points in twenty minutes so to extrapolate it on a thirty minute right like it feels like his fouls drawn per forty when he plays these higher um, these higher minute games right. Might be a little bit higher than 3.5, closer to you know four or five, which is terrifying when you play the guy that leads the country in foul strong. So I don't think of of all the five, and this probably makes him very contrarian because of his price tag and because of the matchup. I don't have a lot of interest in Donovan Klingon, which makes him very like appealing as a contrarian, like solo a solo shipper, right? I could see Donovan Klingon in the captain spot as a solo ship to win it all. Ooh. But you have to have like literally everything go right. And you better be, you you know, I, I don't see a way that he really gets there with Edie on the floor for 40 minutes. Like that's, that's Man, tough. We were, we were talking about this in the group chat, reminiscing to <laughs> the start of the season prior where we yeah. were saying, man, I, I hope Edie got his conditioning up and he can play. <laughs> 26 minutes right he played 40 and 39 minutes respectively in those last two games and to yeah. to your point about about foul calls right like i i think it's going to be a pretty clear theme early in this game oh, that boy. paint is going to want to get get ed banging down there yeah, with, with clean it early there. right like he he picks up an early foul and yep. granted yukon is one of the deepest and most versatile teams in mm. college basketball in recent memory even right but like you get you get clinging into a little bit Samson of foul trouble Johnson early, <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden, like you know, they're the 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 tools they can reach into their bag and get start to get yeah, a little bit limited. Shorter. So that I mean, they're going to test him real early in this game and see if they can't get a cheap. I, I so the women's championship game, they let him play. They even the announcers like today they were like, shout out South Carolina. Um, it's a great team, man. Uh, yeah. I think they've undefeated in the season. <laughs> like, I don't know why people are shocked that they like <laughs> won yeah. the national championship. People are devastated. It wasn't yeah. I got kind of upset about Dom <laughs> Staley crying. I'm like, what are, you, what are you crying for? Like, you, <laughs> you beat everybody. Like, it's, so it's kind of expected. Um, yeah. but that's the kind of change that Caitlin Clark has brought about. But, um, you know, kind of circling back to, to this, right? Like, it's, 
Ah, oh, man. I, Donovan Klingon at like a low owned 30 minutes, not in foul trouble. Solo shipper is definitely appealing. But the range of outcomes that have to happen. Edie probably needs to be in foul trouble. Mm. Um, you better hit on everything else in this game. Um, you're going to need to pick between TKR. If Edie is in foul trouble, you need to pick the right guy between TKR and Gillis. Um, that has to be in there. Heidi's probably going to need to be in there to play some minutes too. So yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't feel great. I think when I look at, so Tristan Newton, man, like I feel like with just kind of the way you save another almost thousand dollars when you go to Tristan Newton at the captain at 15, three, um, we know he's got that 40 plus fantasy ceiling. Um, because Cam Spencer has 40 plus fantasy ceiling. I feel like him and Klingon are uh, Newton and Klingon will be a little more contrarian. Now we're talking about contrarian, contrarian, contrarian. Well, who the hell are people playing? Because we're not thinking Zach Eady's going to be like, you can't build a roster with him. Uh, and then we're like, Donovan Klingon's terrifying. Tristan Newton's just because of the price tag, you look at Spencer, Caravan, Castle, and Braden Smith, and you're like, oh, you feel better because you can put six guys that you like. You look at your, you look at your phone or your, your computer and you're like, that feels a lot better. Yeah. But really, when you talk about ceilings, there's four guys and five guys in, in this game that can really just go nuclear at that one and a half X. That's Klingon, that's Newton, that's Spencer. Um, and then you're looking at Edie and even a Braden Smith on, on the other side. So those are the five guys that will clear 40. Um, I don't see anybody else clearing 40. Uh, now, obviously, there's a points per dollar factor. So that's when you drop down to Caravan Castle. But I think, man, wouldn't it be weird to be like Cam Spencer is like the maybe one of the more popular captain options because of the price tag? I mean, you're spending 14 4 He's got 40 fantasy point upside. You play him with one cheapie, you can get anything else you want because you've only spent 17000 You can go out and get four other guys for the remaining 33000 and and you feel uh, you know, you feel a lot better. You play someone like TKR or something like that with him, and then all of a sudden, like your entire lineup just like completely changes. So uh, you know, yeah, that, that would never work. But if you just if you play ED on <laughs> but play ED on that side and play one of the cheapies. Uh, so if you play ED and you play Diara. Like you're looking at mid six, right? Like or mid five there. Five so five, that's yeah. with Edie at flex. So you can, you're, you're probably going to have to punt one guy from, you know, Purdue or, you know, even play like a, a Gillis here or a TKR probably to get you back up to that six K range. Um, but these guys, I feel like be a little more popular though. The Cam Spencers, the Alex Caravans, the Stefan Castles, those guys may be a little more popular than Tristan Newton, Donovan Klingon, um, I say that in theory, but a lot of the times people are just like, well, who has the highest ceiling? We're just going to jam them into the captain spot. And honestly, when I go and actually build the lineups, I may just go with that. And hell, I might take a, a three from somebody and it might, it will probably end up optimal because we see that you see that in football, you see it in NBA. It's like, okay, this guy didn't do anything, but he's on the optimal because he nailed the five like highest scores or highest point per dollar guys um, on the slate. So um, not to, you know, I just feel like the ownership, it's going to be fun because it's not going to be like this one captain that's going to be 50%. You're going to have spread out captains. It's going to be spread. So that's, I, I feel like you could solo ship on a on, on that since it's just, you're going to be, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be ch- chopping a lot with ED ones and clinging ones and even Newton ones. So these ones where you can kind of get different are Spencer, Caravan. DR, if you can get a 20, it <laughs> feels good at the captain spot because now you can play ED. Now you can play Lance Jones. Now you can play uh, Cam Spencer with him. So it feels like DR is going to garner a little bit of uh, captain's uh, ownership here. I mean, 8,100 there. You go in, you toss in ED. You play a, 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 a Gillis with him, and then you can get two of the studs, essentially. So, um like you're at, if you put in Gillis there, you're averaging what eight, over eight K per player. And a half. I mean, it feels good. Half K. If you play TKR there instead, I fit instead of it now it gets you up to like seventy seven hundred per player. If you take yeah. uh, Gillis out, if you play Heidi and there, is, just this is for early seven. in the build, right? Yes. With, with Gillis in there, you've got seven point five K for three different players. So just, a lot of different ways you could you could knife that up. Yeah. So. Yeah, I feel like ownership in the captain spot, uh, really, really interesting. Um, if I had to pick between these middle guys, man, Castle's just so, like, up and down. I would almost play the caravan theory where 
Klingon gets into foul trouble. Caravan has to shoot a lot of threes. They got to play more mm-hmm. perimeter oriented. But because Caravan's coming off this 32, I feel like he's going to be a, a, a solid popular pick for captain. He's just 12 3. You put him with DR, you put him with another starter from UConn that's not Klingon. Now you go on the other side, you get your TK or your, or your Gillis or even a Heidi punt. You get Edie in there. Now you play a Lance Jones or a, you know, uh, now you can get to one of those kind of that third or fourth option for, uh, for Purdue. But when you look at it from a sense of like UConn, uh, it doesn't feel great on the stacking to, to play multiple guys on the Purdue side, but for UConn, like any of those guys in the flex, if you just can't get there, like the only way you can get there in the flex is if you take a shot on Lance Jones um, or uh lawyer <laughs> And that just seems like a complete disaster. So, you know, I haven't talked through a lot of this. I, I feel like, yeah, I kind of want to start my my initial builds. Uh, always, we'll always start with Edie, as we always do. But then I want to look at Caravan. I want to look at Spencer. And I want to look at Castle. with the, and, Or now I want to look at Diara. Because those are the cheapest ways to get a bunch of guys that are in there. And if Zach Edie doesn't go for 50, uh, go for 60, then you don't really have to worry about those captain builds with Edie because, you know, you'll beat 90, 90 fantasy points at a 60 spot from, from Zach Edie. So any thoughts on this UConn side, man, between the the Spencer, the Car- – man, the, the different – even Spencer, man, like he, he's pretty expensive from the captain spot. So Caravan or Castle, or what do you think about the DR call, that captain? Yeah, I I really like the DR call, right? Like, um, you know, I I opened the open the show saying that I I tend to look at the players that are most likely to score the the highest amount of points. Um, so DR doesn't necessarily check that box, but what what we do like is that you know for for a guy that's eight K as your captain he's coming in and he, he contributes a lot of different ways, right? Like seventeen percent rebounding for guard, twenty percent assist rate. He can poke out a few steals. He shoots okay from three, right? So, like, if you know, if if we're if we're talking about a theory where you're looking for kind of a pay down option, a captain, so you can go out and get all of these guys uh, in your in your flex spot that you know you you can more dependably rely on their output. Like uh, Hassan Diara is the is the clear option of those, right? Like, I would much rather have him as my captain than I would. Uh, Lance Jones or a Fletcher lawyer, right? So, definitely like the the Diara call, kind of like we did before we before we get out of the uh, the championship game. I want to I want to kind of go through the the same exercise with you that we did on the produce side, running down this uh, this UConn <laughs> roster, right? Like, where's where's that line of demarcation it's... in terms of how far down we're comfortable going? I'll I'll start with Samson Johnson and everyone above that. It's clearly in the pool because the guy above him we just said is an option to captain. <laughs> looking down at Stewart, looking down at Hurley. Andrew Hurley. Ball, no, Ross. Okay, I guess we have to have a conversation, a quick conversation about Stewart because of Edie's fouls. How many times have we seen backup bigs have to play minutes against Purdue in this tournament? Last time out, Ben Middlebrooks. Uh, a bunch of uh, every time out because he's getting <laughs> every single up. time. We had JP Estrella from Tennessee log in like 18 minutes. That's insane. It's absolutely insane. He's a good player. Like, I mean, Cal, I mean, not Calipari. Uh, Hurley has been on record, like essentially begging him to, to wait <laughs> and not get into the transfer portal after this year because obviously you're probably going to lose a lot of guys. Um, Going into the offseason, he's going to become a focal point, and we'll never play him for this price tag ever again because he's again. super super talented. Um, you can just see it off the limited minutes. You're like, oh god, like this guy's going to absolutely explode um, when he starts getting 30 minutes. So, yeah, he's oh, because of the game theory of Klingon. I don't know who the hell got like Samson Johnson is going to have a. He's long, but he is small. Like he is skinny, not small. He's skinny. Yeah. And Zach Eady, I feel like I'm gonna throw him around. Stewart's got not as tall, but he's gonna have a little more weight behind him. Jalen Stewart is is in the player pool, I guess you should say, and and maybe a way to get real cheap. I mean, I'd rather play him than a Colvin, right? If you're gonna play Heidi, you might as well play Stewart, like twelve hundred dollars cheaper because you get all these fouls from Edie. Edie's gonna get a bunch of fouls like drawn, like that's just what he does. There's just, there's just no way. 
when he gets 30 post ups that he's not going to get some foul draw. So yeah, I, I guess we could we could talk Jalen Stewart. I wouldn't. I absolutely like how much I'll get to him. I don't know. It's just going to depend on the refs, man. So if you think you think the refs are going to kind of handcuff these teams, uh, especially the UConn side in the front court, then I would look strongly at Caravan. I would look. You kind of have to look at Samson Johnson because Samson Johnson on the other side, he's going to pose an annoying threat. It's like a lob thrower uh, for ED defensively. Um, he's kind of got a knack for offensive rebounds and stuff like that. So it's going to be real annoying. Whereas Klingon's the banger, right? Like you don't really have to worry about him kind of going over the top most of the time. So, yeah, I mean, if Sanson Johnson, I really wish he was like sub 4K on this slate. We couldn't even get that, though. <laughs> I mean, it kind of it kind of doesn't matter, though, right? Like we're we're following down the track that there are, you know, four probably three guys that are very expensive that are going to be the most popular captain options. And in turn, because of that, that means that Samson Johnson is going to be super popular. Uh, uh, Heidi is going to be super popular because like you have to have one of these like low fours or below <laughs> guys just to do anything else with your roster top. right so yeah like i mean re- regardless of uh how much we don't like their price tag or how it's probably not a smart play on paper like these guys are going to be super popular because it just it gives you enough flexibility with the rest of your build right foul committed for samson johnson 7.2 per four <laughs> like he's fouling out of this game <laughs> <laughs> He's doing the uh, the Grant Nelson from like a month ago kind of. Kinda he averaged game. like he, he averaged like what thirteen minutes this year. Uh, yeah, so my God, seven points. Uh, I mean, yeah, sixteen not, not, sixteen minutes per game this year. It's not terrible. Like when you're at, at per forty seven, right? Like, but he by far, uh, <laughs> if anybody that plays any minutes on this thing, is uh, yeah, he's gonna. <laughs> Which man, Jalen Stewart, man, we're gonna we can keep talking talking through this and and have a little more Jalen Stewart than I thought. Yeah, we're gonna Zach we're e. gonna talk Mike into thirty five percent Jalen Stewart. Thirty five percent fouls drawn. Zach Eady nine point six for forty free throw rate eighty three percent free throw rate. Uh, jeez, man, yeah, it's gonna be awesome, man. But yeah, anything else on the DFS streets, man? Uh, hopefully. You- Kind of laid out pretty much all everything and what it's going to look like. Yeah, it's just uh, obviously going to come down to that one build or maybe several hundred builds that do that same thing to win. Yeah, I mean, I I think that's that's really it, right? Like, honestly, as as we we sit here now, I I still think I'm probably going to be a little overweight at ED captain, just knowing that I'm gonna I'm gonna burn a fair amount of lineups, but. In the ones where where you know the uh, the right pieces fall in place, I'm going to ladder up real quickly. You know that's that feels super keen in my eye. But realistically speaking, like if I want to build a more projectable lineup, right? I I really like getting into the Braden Smiths into the Cam Spencer kind of realm because you can just do so much with the rest of your build. So an even mix of the two, but. I mean, I'll, I'll plant my flag. I'm planning on going overweight at ED at captain and knowing that a lot of those <laughs> rosters will be cooked. And that's fine, right? Here for commas, not for comas. Before we close out the proceedings around the national title game, Mike, I think there's a couple of prize picks that are catching your eyes. You want to walk the people through that before we start looking to the offseason? Yeah, uh, so a couple of them catch my eye. There's some sharp lines, man. I was lucky enough to hit another six pick NBA. Sent that over to you, and just the things you have to do to hit a six pick are like <laughs> it's I mean, overtime, last minute free throws, like layups in under a minute. It's uh, it's pretty insane to hit those six picks. But two in the last three days, man. So I'm feeling pretty good about price picks right now. A uh, combination of women's college basketball and NBA uh, have sauced it up over the last few days. But when I'm looking at this, man, like I'm looking at Mason Gillis uh, over eight and a half points plus rebounds. I feel like he's going to play a pivotal role in this, as I described earlier, over TKR because of his perimeter skills and perimeter defense. Um, so, yeah, over eight and a half points plus rebounds, I'm over that. So uh, give me the over on that. It feels good to press Stefan Castle at 11 points. Um, the over on 11 points for Stefan Castle. Uh yeah, he's the lowest of all the guys. He's been playing well. A guy that can get to the free throw line, uh, athletically, like gonna have a gonna have an advantage on a lot of these Purdue guys. 
Um, you have to figure Lance Jones is going to spend a ton of time on Spencer and, and Newton. So you're going to get Stephon Castle on some lawyer. And uh, as long as the lawyer's not flopping around the court, I feel like Stephon Castle is going to get to the line, be able to make some things happen at the rim. I am uh, I'm a little terrified on the uh, the PRA for Donovan Klingon at 23 and a half just because of the matchup and because of the fouls. So if I were looking at any under right now, it's probably Donovan Klingon under 23 and a half. Uh, but I'm not setting stone on that one. That's just like the under that I'm really, really looking at. Um, all these other point lines, and like, man, like these are sharp. Like I don't – yeah, it's it's tough to look at anything else. So really what I'm feeling right now is the over on Castle 11 points and then Mason Gillis – the over on eight and a half points plus rebounds. So that is uh, yeah, definitely like, like those two as the, the ones to, to really lock in. And then, like you mentioned, Klingon, you know, he's, he's going to be in for a long day in the <laughs> office on Monday. So if, if you're looking for a third piece to stretch that out to, uh, to a three legger, you can go under on his 23 and a half PRA. So, Little prize picks love before we move out of this season and into next season. And part of that move to next season looks like we got a little bit of coaching news. I don't know if anyone's heard of this guy. Someone named John Calipari is uh, reportedly <laughs> heading to, to Arkansas. Mike, is is this is this official? Official? Do do you do you know anyone who's uh, who's who's uh, who's reporting this as? Um, as as on wax and on the record, or is this still uh, very hot speculation? Yeah, I mean, pretty good news source in Trilly Donovan. So, I mean, he's very rarely wrong. Um, Arkansas don't mind spending some money. Uh, they were spending money in the portal all last season. So, yeah, and I just think that it's kind of those mutual things. And Kentucky's kind of ready. I think Cal's probably ready to – so to move away from that situation, it just might be best for a fresh start. Uh, Jeff saying Arkansas money putting Cal on the transfer portal. <laughs> yeah, wild stuff for sure, Cam. Uh, we'll see if it all you know goes down, shakes up. Man, I just I, both parties just need they just need to separate from each other. I feel like we're gonna go through this again next year where it's like a bunch of talented dudes. Why aren't they? It's gonna be the story of the first round for them next year if if Cal's still at Kentucky. So. Uh, they might not be uh, when they when they if they lose him. The grass isn't always greener all the time. So I know Kentucky's a hotbed. Yeah. They've got they've got money. They've got you know fan base. They've got the prestige like recruiting. But this guy is like has so many former superstars, superstars. But today's today's college basketball is won by the portal and by older players. Um, I think COVID has really had a lot to do because you got the six seventh year guys like. I feel like Calipari is better when it's just regular. Like you get your five guys, the uh, you don't have these 23, 24, 25 year old players playing against these guys. So we'll see, man. It's not always greener, but uh, interesting for sure. It is not always greener, but in the time that you've been breaking that down, we are officially official. Goodman tweeting it out. Jeff Borzello reporting it as well as Pete <laughs> Mel. So we have that. Officially on wax, looking like a five-year deal to head up the Arkansas program for Crazy. Coach Cal. So end of an era there in Kentucky and end of a season, like we mentioned, off the rip, which means that we're heading into portal season, right? We've got a uh, we've got a couple of five packs here of both new players heading into the, the portal and some of the latest commits to designate their new home for the upcoming season. Mike, let's start with uh, with some of these latest commits. Uh, we've got a five pack that we're working through here. Who's the first name that has announced their new residence for next season? Yeah, so a guy that we talked about, I think about a week ago, um, as a fabulous two way player, it's Kobe Johnson. He's not going very far. Uh, across the street, actually. So he's the <laughs> number seven now on our big board. That'll be released on Tuesday. The 6'6 six, six wing from USC is going to UCLA. It was funny. I saw a tweet where uh, he's, you know, he's mocking the uh, the UCLA fans, and now he's committed to UCLA. So this is the times we live in with the transfer portal. 
Average 11 points, you know, four and a half boards, three and a half assists, two over two steals. One of the best defender, perimeter defenders in the country. We kind of know like disastrous off or last year and off season for UCLA and Mick Cronin tried to go out and get all these international guys. Like none of them worked out. Half of them in the portal of the day. Uh, Fibliol is in there. Like it just didn't work out. So now you have Kobe Johnson, uh, very strong. I think he's got a little more offensive game that he can display now that he's kind of away from, you know, the Isaiah Colliers, the the Boogie Ellis's, the Drew Petersons, um, the Bronny James situation. You know what I mean? It's just kind of away from that. Uh, maybe a little bit more of a primary, uh, you know, option on offense here at UCLA. We'll see. Obviously, they got Sky Clark as well from Louisville, which I don't know how that fits, but we'll, uh, I guess, we'll figure it out. It's gonna be interesting to see Cronin and, and Sky Clark go at it. But this is an awesome pickup. It's been an awesome pickup for anybody. I don't care who the coach is. Like this guy's a dog on both ends. So really like this uh, Kobe Johnson news to UCLA. Good get for Coach Cronin there. Who you got next for us? And a a huge get for Coach Cronin and a Bruins team that was was starting to put some stuff together down the down the stretch run, right? There's you know, kind of kind of a lost season for them on the whole, but showed a little bit of promise heading into the offseason and then go out and add some key pieces like Kark, like Kobe Johnson. Definitely feel like we're uh, we're looking at a pretty quick rebound for the Bruins uh, as we head into next season. Player I want to talk about is Terrence Edwards, the wing out of James Madison. He's committed to Louisville. Um, so we mentioned Sky Clark heading out. In comes Terrence Edwards. Uh, <laughs> for, for James Madison, Edwards played 36 games. He gave him about 30 minutes per game. Was shipping in 17 points, four and a half boards, three and a half assists, just under the Heinrich line, 34% from three. So he'll, uh, I'm, I'm sure he'll hit the gym and, and work to get past that 35% mark so that he doesn't have to hear it from Jay all throughout the course of the offseason. I mean, like, this is a guy that was the Sun Belt player of the, of the year last year. You know, you look at some of his marquee games, put up a 24 spot against Michigan State to open the season, put up 14 in that first round win over Wisconsin. He's just a super versatile offensive player, right? He can handle the ball. He can get his own shot. And now with him coming in, with Rain Smith coming in, like, you know, we've we've got we got Coach Kelsey coming in. He's he's got a he's got a little bit of a talent to work with, right? So, kind of kind of nowhere to go up for for Louisville relative to the last <laughs> season. But you know, even kind of setting that context aside, uh, you know, a, a, a lot to be optimistic about. That has a lot to do with guys like Smith and with guys like the newly minted Edwards. So, Mike, three more people to talk about here that have committed to their next programs. And next up, we've got. Brandon Huntley Hatfield. Yeah, at the aforementioned that Louisville Cardinals, since their entire team's in the transfer portal, uh, 6'10, 240 pounds, man, like a very, very high pedigree as far as a recruit a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, got the run uh, that she was really looking for. You know, started off at Tennessee, yeah. got out of there after some limited run. He played almost 31 minutes a game, that was 13 points, eight boards, shot 43% from three. Um, so, you know, really kind of, kind of showing out a, a versatile all around game. I think he gets some, you know, get a little bit more done defensively than kind of what we've seen. He's a plus rebounder, obviously. And, uh, as far as like what you're losing, you're losing DJ Burns. Um, you know, it sucks that he had to play Edie in his final game because he didn't do much. Uh, but that was kind of fun to watch them bang around for a little bit. You know, I've got to figure out what decisions are going to be made for the rest of the guys, you know, Middlebrooks and Yara, I think have the COVID option to come back. But you are losing uh, Burns, so yeah, Brandon Huntley Hatfield kind of slotting in there, uh, more on the mold I feel like of a, a kind of a cross between uh, between a DR and a Burns. So uh, a versatile player, uh, and I think he'd be more versatile on both ends of the floor. So Huntley Hatfield checks in at forty eight on our big board right now, number fifty two, man, uh, guy we played a lot in DFS because Miami was beat up, but you got uh, your boy Bensley Joseph here headed over to Providence. Man, Miami was beat up, and Bensley Joseph quietly took a, a pretty nice step forward this year, right? So, you know, someone that we like to cover a lot because we're we're largely talking about the DFS angle, but, you know, generally kind of under the radar in, in terms of the, the national media coverage. And, you know, despite this kind of lost season for Miami, uh, you know, following that incredible run in the in the prior year, you know, we, we look at Bensley Josephs, he, he still put up pretty solid production even though he was kind of a kind of a secondary piece for this Hurricanes team, you know, I, I think now that we we talk about this this move over to Providence, 
this is a Providence team that, um, you know, played very well under then first year coach Kim English now heading into a second season, but also has a, has some pretty big shoes to fill with Devin Carter deciding to head <laughs> to the NBA draft. So yeah. Bensley Jones is, is, I mean, he's one of these guys that we love his game. We, we love his ability to produce in limited run. And I, I think moving over to Providence, Providence, he should see a bit more time on the court and that, that really gives him a lot of upside. So love the fit, love the opportunity that it creates for Joseph. Mike, close us out here with number 57 for the moment on your big board. Yeah, 57 is Brandon Johnson, probably a little bit higher than most places, but I just love the uh, the wingspan here, the length, the kind of what he can do um, on both ends of the floor. 6'8", 210, he's committed to Miami. Um, hey, so here we go. All the pieces just running one out, right? <laughs> uh, played 35 minutes a game, 14 points, almost nine boards, almost two steals, 36% from three. Uh, obviously can really shoot it from three, a great rebounder for his position, can play some of that stretch four as well. Miami's got Nigel Pack coming back. They got Lynn Kidd. Uh, coming in from Virginia Tech, we talked about on our last offseason edition. Uh, and now you bring in Brandon Johnson. So I know Coach Larry Nag is going to be back. It really was just health for Miami. It wasn't much more to do with that. And they just, they just couldn't really gel everything because they were always injured. Like that. That's what we talked about in DFS all the time. There, who's, who are we playing because everyone's injured um, or somebody's injured last minute? So uh, they should have a very good core with at least those three guys. There's a bunch of decisions still to be made from their team. But, yeah. I really like uh, really like what they did bringing in uh, Brandon Johnson here from ECU. Yeah, Bron- uh, Johnson's going to be in a, a, a really solid spot to contribute for this Hurricanes team next season. So, like the fit, we will uh, we will certainly hope to see Miami pull things together and turn it around next year. And we will pull things together at least uh, on the uh, on the rundown here to. Our last segment of the show, we've gone through some of the new guys that have committed, but there are a fresh pack of names that have entered the portal and have yet to decide or at least declare where they are going to go, one of which technically broke on the show last time that we were out here, (laughs) but late enough to where he couldn't make the graphics. So he is now newly minted atop the graphic and atop your transfer portal big board for now. John L. Davis, Mike. What do the people need to know about the former Owl? Yeah, he's talented, and you should remember him from a few seasons ago <laughs> as a, kind of the number one option for this Florida Atlantic team. Uh, they had a very good year this year. Obviously, anything less than what they did last year was going to be considered uh, you know, kind of a failure. Uh, I think they still did really well, um, obviously making the tournament, even though some people had them out. But we've seen him be an alpha, and it, it's, it was on a Final Four team. They stepped up in competition uh, this year, moving conferences. So playing in the AAC, still had a fantastic year, 18.6 boards, three assists, shot 41% from three. He's clearly a game changer anywhere he's going to go. So, uh, you know, most people, uh, you know, you don't, have to, you don't have to really talk much about John L. Davis to know that he's a absolute game changer. So he is atop our big board. Uh, getting up, getting there above the big guys there. So uh, we got a, a darling here for our second player we're going to talk about from uh, from your Oakland squad, man. Who you got? Yeah, Trey, Trey Townsend checking in at number 39 on the big board. Uh, played a ton of games and pretty much all the minutes for, for Oakland this year. In playing those minutes, he gave them about 17 points, about eight boards, and about three assists per game. Shot pretty well from downtown. I mean, look, he, by all accounts, was the headliner of this Cinderella <laughs> story run in March. Obviously, uh, Golki became kind of the uh, <laughs> kind of the cult favorite as he's out there shooting insurance commercials in hotel lobbies <laughs> immediately after the game. But you know, categorically, Townsend was you know uh, was easily the the biggest contributor to this to this March run for for Oakland. You know, just completely balled out against Xavier. Had a fantastic game against Kentucky. You know, probably probably a little undersized for his position, right? A forward at six 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 two thirty. You know, might want to see a little bit more length there. But I mean, we've we've seen him, you know, perform uh, very well against Power Six competition. So uh, you know, he's got the game to kind of overcome any sort of height deficiencies. And also, you know, there's there's context here. Like Trey Townsend, he. He is the he is the children he's the son excuse me of of Oakland alumni. Had his parents not gone 
to Oakland, he probably already would have been in the power six ranks. So, you know, he, he went in, he, uh, he did the legacy thing for a season yeah. with Oakland. Now he is in the portal and he is going to be highly regarded by a number of power conference teams. One of those power conference teams, Ohio state has a hole open because of the number 54 player on your board, Roddy Gale. What do we, uh, what do we need to know about the former Buckeye here? Yeah, I mean, this one's not really surprising, right? Like Michi Johnson's coming back. Um, I don't know that it has a lot to do with that, but obviously playing that same kind of off-ball position. Um, it's all in sophomore season, man. Like we talked about, you know, these freshmen that were uh, that were essentially going to be the the primary players for Ohio State, Thornton, Gale, Okpara. Uh, you look at the numbers, 13 and a half points, four and a, four and a half rebounds, three assists, like pretty good year uh, by all accounts. Uh you know, with his current trajectory, like I, I going into his junior year, right? We'll see another leap forward, be more of a stable force. So, uh, you know, coming in is Michi Johnson as Roddy Gale's heading out. So I meant to say there, but um, yeah, I, I feel like there's going to be a ton of teams after this guy. Uh, his game's just going to continue to grow, and whoever gets him is going to kind of get him as he's on his ascent to the peak of his uh, at least his college career. So. A uh, very good player. I think whoever lands him, I've seen you very happy. Number 54 player on the big board right now. A guy not too far down, Colin Boswell, man, sitting there at uh, number 62 from a, uh, a team that was, man, for much of the year considered <laughs> the best team in college basketball. So thoughts on uh, Boswell jumping in from Arizona? Yeah, look, I mean, he's he's got experience playing at, um, you know, at a very high level, right? You mentioned this Arizona squad was – um, you know, at, at times considered one of the, the best teams in the land. Uh, many people, Jay Heinrich included, had selected them to win the national title this year. Um, so, you know, you, you, you love to see a guy that, you know, has, has played in those, you know, in those bright light type of moments. Looking at his year, he, he had kind of an up and down season. I, I think it had more to do with a fairly limited role in terms of the way <laughs> that the Wildcats use him, right? But he can he can give you playmaking. He can shoot pretty well. He saw it on the defensive side, right? So like, there there are a number of different ways that a team can use him. And, and you've you've got to remember, right? He's coming off of his his sophomore year, but he skipped his senior year of high school. So um, you know, very very young by um, you know by by that regard, and still has some some development in front of him, right? There's still some upside that that is untapped. So you know, it, it'll be interesting to see where, where he lands, you know, uh, hopefully it's somewhere that he can get a little bit more usage. You know, hopefully it is a, it is another program that has strong coaching and development ties to really see his game reach that, that peak potential. But Kylan Boswell, there, I mean, there's a lot to like about his, his game and what he can bring to a team. So definitely an interesting name to watch as is the number 73 player. Mike, close us out here with Kerry Booth. Yeah. Kerry Booth jumping in here, man. I was hoping Notre Dame would retain the uh, you know the, the trio of freshmen that uh, really played well this year for a team that we were like, man, they're going to take their licks, but you develop these guys. Well, now Booth jumping in the portal, 6'10", 205. Uh, more of a stretch four, could even play a little bit of three. Um, average, and only 20 minutes, like over six points, over four boards. Um, as per minute. The average is really solid. Showed three point range this year. It's going to get a little bit bigger in the off season. I think we see that with a lot of players from their freshman to sophomore year. Uh, you know, obviously put on some muscle, put on some weight. Uh, awesome upside though for this guy. I think he can put it together by next year. So yeah, rounding our uh, our pack out, our five packs as we do this off season is uh, is Kerry Booth sitting here at seventy three in the transfer portal and on the big board. On the big board and a big board that is getting ready for its debut in a few days. So definitely love running through these guys that have committed and the new guys that have entered into the portal. And speaking of guys that have committed, sounds like uh, sounds like Jeff's feeling pretty excited about <laughs> Doug McDaniel heading over to K-State. Did, yeah, the, uh, did the traditional <laughs> Yeah, did, did the traditional thing, which is guards heading to K-State in general, but also thumbed his nose at Kansas on his way in, made some spicy comments about <laughs> Bill Self and the Jayhawks. So love to see him coming in, stoking the fires. Mike, any thoughts about uh, about McDaniel making his way into the Wildcats program? I mean, it makes sense, right? Like Marquis Noel uh, from a few years ago. Uh, Tyler Perry, like, yeah, it wasn't, 
was the I mean, he had a good year. season. It wasn't the ceiling type season that you know we kind of all expected, but a very good year overall. So yeah, he's had great success, uh, Coach Tang, with you know bringing in these guys or working with these guys in their first year. That you know Perry's a, a little bit bigger than than what you'll find with McDaniel at five eleven, one seventy five, and then obviously Marquise Noel was a little you know little guy at five what I mean maybe five eight. So. Yeah, this is a really good spot. Um, so I think Doug McDaniel is going to – I think that he had to carry so much for Michigan. It was kind of ridiculous really at that point. So it's just kind of like, uh, yeah, let's get with Tang, get some get some other pieces around you, and uh, a new Big 12 without Texas OU. We'll see what Kansas State can do. So, uh, yeah, yeah, man. He had, to, he had to carry so much for Michigan as long as they were at home, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which is one of the weirdest suspension structures I think I've ever heard. So, <laughs> so weird. Doug McDaniel heading to <laughs> heading to K-State as we get ready to head out, right? We are uh, well inside of 24 hours before the national title game tips off. It was a ton of fun going through the showdown slate and talking through all the different permutations and game theories and different ways that you can try to attack this one. If you are watching this on the replay and you have any questions, get up into that comment section and let us know. You know, if you're talking about a last guy in, you're talking about some 1v1 swaps, whatever it is, we'll be keeping a close eye on that to make sure we're getting you all the information you need. And like I like I alluded to a moment ago, like Mike teased even, even a few minutes prior to that, we're a few days away from the premiere of the top 200 big board, the transfer portal board that will grow from 200 to 500 to eventually 5,000. Mike, can you tell the people a little bit about what to expect with the transfer portal coverage as we start to shift into off-season mode? Yeah, we dropped it, I think, last year, right May 1st. Well, since uh, things are going down rapidly, we're trying to get this thing out earlier for you guys. It drops on drrodo.com. Uh, I typically have an article attached to it or some notes about recent commits, a lot of stuff that you find from the shows that we do as well. Um, thoughts on as we get deeper into the transfer portal, you know, top portal classes, um, just because you win the transfer portal, uh, you know, game doesn't necessarily <laughs> mean you're going to win on the court. So we'll talk a lot about fit in the off season. Uh, yeah, man. So we'll, uh, Mipsy Hustle has been, I've been honestly the reason why we're getting this thing out uh, much faster than we did last year because he is uh, he's been in there grinding out stats, getting that information in there. So he's been he's been killing it. Been a great addition to the team this past year. So able to get more content out to you guys. Drrota.com is where you can find it, and where you can find it also is on our shows. We'll be talking about these five packs and uh, who's committing, who's in, who's going there, and then we'll start to uh, to kind of go full off season mode. Uh, once tomorrow night wraps up. Yeah, the uh, the off season is is one of the the fun parts of the year, right? You guys have been riding with us all year and and seeing these green screens, getting this bread. But all of that work starts in April of the prior year, right? Making sure that we have our finger on the pulse of which players are heading to new programs, our finger on the pulse of coaching changes and what that means for how they're going to approach the game and for the existing roster, right? So. College basketball never sleeps, and we vow to never sleep in our coverage of it. We got a got we got some we got some warm words from uh, from Forklift Jeremy on our way out here. Appreciate you swinging through and rocking with us all, all all season long. It's been fun to have you in the comments and part of this community. And definitely let us know. We know that you got a couple of those uh, those tickets punched. So want to see this all come to fruition with a big payday to close out the year. Forklift Jeremy, Jeff Gagner, Cam C. Thuggin himself, as well as Scott Harris, all jumping in tonight. Appreciate all of you rocking with us and keeping that chat lively as we proceed through. Like Mike mentioned, keep an eye on drrodo.com. That is where the first version of that transfer portal big board is going to be dropping in a few days. And if you are not already, make sure you're subscribed here. You have that notification bell on because we're going to be pushing shows to you all off season long, but for one final time in the 2023 2024 season, let's head on out. And let's get this bread. Thanks for stopping by the office. Get your fantasy prescription by subscribing to the channel and checking out drrodo.com. And until the next visit, be well and take care.